We're going to start, I'm excited because today we're going to launch a new uh, message series. And the message series is just entitled this, Things God Never Said. Things God Never Said. Um, we're going to talk about some different cultural beliefs because people have had these beliefs for years and they're attributed to God, but the reality is these are things that God never said. And so today, here's the first one we're going to talk about this morning. And I think it's probably one of the most popular disbeliefs in our American church culture today. And that's this. Above all else, God wants you to be happy. Above all else, I would love with all of my heart to be able to stand here today and tell you that above all else, God wants you to be happy. That above all else, God wants you to enjoy life. That above all else, God only wants good things to happen to you and never bad things. I'd love to tell you that, that the bottom line today is God wants you to be happy. I can even take you to Scripture in the New Living Translation in, in Psalm chapter 97, verse 12. And here's what Psalm 97, verse 12 says in the Living Translation. It says, may all who are godly be what? Oh, come on now. We need a little bit. <laughs> Say it like you mean it, right? May all who are godly be what? Happy. happy. Absolutely. So this should be a happy, joyous day in the Lord. We could dance a little bit. Maybe not. Okay. Uh, my wife tells me that whenever I try to dance, have you ever seen like the dancing Santas? Where they move their hands, but they don't move their feet? That's me, right? God wants you to be happy. We want you to have fun. We should be having fun today. But the problem is, this is one of the biggest cultural mistakes in what people believe about God. Is because they believe that above everything else, God wants me to be happy. And if you'll start down this misbelief, I want to show you some of the things that will happen. Let's just call this the theology of happiness, if we will. And if you believe that God's supreme goal is for you to be happy, here's what eventually you're going to start to do. Number one is this. Whatever makes me happy is right. You're going to say this. Whatever makes me happy is what right, and whatever makes me unhappy is wrong. If your philosophy is God is going to, he, God exists to make me happy, then you're going to come to this place. There's even a song that says, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. Hmm. Number one, if it makes me happy, it must be right. And whatever makes me unhappy must be wrong. Number two is this. We start to believe that discomfort, delay, risk, suffering, inconvenience, or obstacles can't possibly be God's will. It can't possibly be God's will. Because if things aren't going right, then God must not be working in my life. Number three. Without even knowing it or noticing it, you start to worship the false gods of comfort and money, pleasure and things. Because if I believe that all else God wants me to be happy, then one day I'm going to start doing that. Here's the problem though. When we believe that God wants above all else me to be happy, suddenly we're pushed into this thought process that says God exists to serve us. You have to get this. You have to understand. Don't miss this. If you miss everything today, I don't want you to miss this. God does not exist to serve you. You exist to serve Him. I'm going to say that again. God does not exist to serve you. You exist to serve Him. If we exist to serve, if God were to make me happy and He exists to serve me, and we reduce the Creator of the universe, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Holy One, if we have that kind of mentality that He is only here to serve me, we have made God into this cosmic Coke machine. That if I put money in it and press the button, I've done my part. And contractually, that machine must give me exactly what I want and what I've asked for. And so without knowing it, this is what we do. We reduce God down to some kind of formula. And we say this, we say, God, I said my prayers. God, I went, I went to church. I, I'm trying to do good things. I, I tried not to do any bad things today. 
I gave a little money in the offering. I helped a little lady across the street. I dodged my neighbor's cat. (laughs) God, I've done all these good things. So God, therefore, I should get that promotion. Therefore, God, I should get that dream house. I, 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 should, I should have all of these people like me. And because, Lord, I, I came in and I put the money in and I pressed the button. Mm. So, God, you should do whatever I want you to do. And the tragedy of this misbelief is this. So many people end up walking away from God for totally the wrong reasons because of wrong beliefs. <laughs> Amen. They'll say things like this. You know, I tried church. Oh, I know. Those pews are hard. Those pews are hard. They'll say things like this, man. I tried church. And it didn't make me any happier. You know, I tried religion, and it it just didn't work. I I tried that that God thing. I read the Bible for a little while. But I still have cancer. My kids still rebel. I'm still not any better off financially. I, I tried that religion, and it didn't work. That's because you're in a belief system that says God is existing to make me happy. And when I'm not happy, it forces me to believe the fact that God must have failed. And we start with the wrong presupposition, which leads us to a dangerous place. I'm going to tell you something today that probably is not what you came to church to hear this morning, but it's truth. And that's this, that God doesn't exist to make you happy. And there are times in life that God doesn't want you to be happy. Oh, that just rocks somebody's world, right? That just rocks somebody's world this morning. Now, don't, don't misunderstand this. Just like a parent, God rejoices when you're blessed. You know, when my kids are doing well, when my kids uh, make that shot, or when they do something, they get those grades, when, when they succeed in life or in a job, man, I'm, I'm ha- it makes me happy. It makes me joyful as their parent, right? When my son was playing basketball, if he'd hit that game-winning shot, that made me super happy. But let me tell you something. If my son makes that game-winning shot and he goes over to the opponent's bench and starts <laughs> acting a fool, right? How many of you know I'm not happy anymore <laughs> as his parent, right? And we've got something else we've got to talk about, right? That's why I'm going to argue with all my heart that God doesn't want us to pursue happiness. God doesn't want you to pursue happiness. He wants you to pursue Him. We don't pursue Him for the byproduct of something great happening in our life. We don't pursue Him for happiness. So if we're not pursuing Him that way, just because we, we believe He'll give us what He wants, what we want to have, we are pursuing Him in such a way that says, I am pursuing you, God, for who you are and for that reason alone. Today, here's what I want to do. I want to dispel probably one of the biggest and most dangerous cultural myths about God. I want to talk about two specific reasons that God does not want you happy. The first one is this. God doesn't want you happy when it causes you to do something wrong or unwise. God doesn't want you happy when it causes you to do something wrong or unwise. When it causes you to do something sinful or stupid, he's not, he doesn't want that to happen. Many people do something that they believe is going to make them happy. The Bible says this, that sin is what? Fun for a season. Makes you happy for a season. 
But here's the fundamental problem that so many people believe. There's a passage of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, and that so many people think that it translates this way. Just as He who called you is happy, so be happy in all you do. But that's not what it says. And yet practically, that's how so many people want to live today. The Bible teaches us that it says this, just as God who called you is holy, we are to be holy or set apart in everything that we do. And yet we believe above all else, God wants us to be happy and then we end up doing things that are wrong or sinful in the pursuit of that happiness. For example, and this is, I've got several things in this list, but for example, let's say this. Let's say you want to eat cake. Notice I said you didn't want to eat a piece of cake. You want the whole cake. Right? My son tried that. He was in college, had a big cheesecake. He ate a quarter of the cheesecake. And then he decided, it's not that big. And he finished the whole thing in one night. That was the longest night he said he's ever had. Right? We don't. God doesn't want you to eat that whole cake. That would be unwise, right? And sometimes you think, man, I'm going to do this because it makes me happy. And, and in the moment, you might be happy. Oh, this tastes so good. But can I tell you, about two or three hours later, you're going to wish you didn't. Or maybe you're the person that hates your job. You can't stand your job. But you got three little kids at home that are all under the age of five. But you'd like to go home, you'd like to go to, to work and just tell your boss what for, right? Say, I hate this place, this is terrible. And guess what? I quit. <laughs> right? And you want to go and do that. But the problem is you don't have another job to go to. But because this job doesn't make you happy. I'm going to quit, man. I'm walking away from this. And how many of you know that's a dumb decision? Why? Because you've got three little birds mouths to feed. That's not wise. But we justify it. We justify doing something stupid because it makes me, doesn't, it either does or doesn't make me happy. You know, that list goes on. You, know, my, you could say something like this, my spouse isn't meeting my needs. You know, I've got needs. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to my computer and start looking at some of this stuff. I know some people think that this is wrong, but I'm just not happy. And if I do these kind of things, it's going to make me happier because I've got needs I need to have met. Some of you, the idea of premarital sex, for those of you who follow Jesus, I hope you understand the fact that the gift of lovemaking was given as a gift from God and meant for the covenant of marriage. But yet, so many Christians have this mentality that says, I don't care. It feels good, and I'm a man, and I've got needs. I'm like a dog. I can't control myself. <laughs> after all, we're in love. And after all, we're married. Here's the, here's the kicker. We're married in our hearts. Right? <laughs> Come on. God wants my body to be happy. And so we justify doing the wrong thing because it makes us happy. I'm going to take this, the next one, and this one will be a little bit more interesting because we talk about our entertainment choices. So many people go to the movies and they watch films or they see stuff on TV and we're entertained by stuff that is just absolutely 100% pure filth. It's just pure sin. Oh, it's funny. It's filthy funny, but it's funny. Mm. But funny doesn't make wrong right. If you're not a Christian today and you're here in, in this service, you're probably thinking, what a crazy guy. 
You know, because if I weren't a Christian, that's probably something I'd be thinking. But today, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have to understand something. We have been called to a higher standard. We have been called to a higher standard. So here's the deal. If you want to watch that, here's what I'm, I'm praying over you. And by the way, you're welcome. Here's what I'm praying over you, that as you're watching this stuff, you've got me on one side and Jesus on the other. And I'm sitting there asking you for some popcorn. I'm like, hey, can I have some popcorn? Are you watching this trash? And Jesus reaches over and says, I'd like to have some popcorn too. I can't believe you're watching this junk. So every time you start to do that with a bag of popcorn, I am believing that you're going to remember this day and this sermon Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. The second thing is this. God doesn't want you happy when it's only based on the things of this world. God doesn't want you happy when it's only based on the things of this world. Have you ever watched advertising? Have you ever watched that kind of thing? Now, there's times that, you know, I get up in the middle of the night and for whatever reason I can't sleep and so I try to turn on some sports show or, or some concert, some Christian talker or something and try to watch TV. Have you ever noticed the advertising just sitting there? The things that you have to have to be happy, right? I, I, I learned that I need a blanket with holes in it, <laughs> right? Some place, because before I never had a place to put my arms, And I had to get them, I had to freeze because I'd have to get them outside the cover just to be able to eat a piece of, uh, of food, right? And then I have to cover back up. But now I've got a blanket with holes in it and I can reach through and I can eat and stay covered and warm all at once. Isn't that amazing? I need that. <laughs> Could you imagine the, the, I also found out I need this knife set. This knife set that has the capabilities of cutting through a tree trunk, I need that. Right? I can cut through tires with this stuff with, because I've always looked for knives before when I went to go cut down a tree or to change my tire. I got, I got to have this miracle lotion that when I put it on, it makes me look like I'm 22. Got to have that, right? There was one thing I saw, and, and it's been a little while back, but one thing I saw is called a shake weight. Anybody ever seen that? That's the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. You've got this shake weight, and you sit there, and it shakes as you're doing this. And it shakes off the weight as you're... Uh, if that's the case, hook me up to something that just shakes everything, right? Come on. Sorry, Lord, that probably wasn't, uh, <laughs> probably wasn't appropriate. But the thing is, our culture tells us that kind of stuff is true. You've got to have this stuff. You've got to have the latest and greatest. And basically, if, if there's, there's this formula that, that kind of comes, and, and here's the formula, if, if you... Basically, if, if you get better possessions, the newest, the fastest, the shinier, the bigger, whatever, and you add to that peaceful circumstances, which basically is the absence of all conflict, and then you add to that thrilling experiences like the perfect vacation or the fun experience or the big hit or the big thrill, and then you add to that the right uh, re uh, relationship. And we have this mentality is that if you're not right, I'll just trade you for somebody else. And then you add to that the perfect appearance. I'm going to tuck it, lift it, pull it, smooth it, whatever, shave it. <laughs> and if you add all those things together and you put all that together at once, this is what will make you happy. 
You'll be happy because all of this equals happiness. The problem is all of these things are based on what I would say are called happenings. And the thing we have to understand is happenings change. That's why no one is really happy all the time in the things of the world. You don't want to know why that is? Because all of those things are counterfeits. They're not real. It's kind of like when you get sent to the grocery store, right? Crystal will send me to buy one thing. Now, you have to understand, anytime a man goes to the grocery store, there's two rules. Number one, you have to get the wrong thing. That's what we do, right? Um, I can't come home. This is one ply. I can't believe you bought one ply. You know to buy two. Right? Not like, not like that happened this week. I'm not, you know. <laughs> but we go to get the wrong thing. Number two is this. Not only do you get the wrong thing, but you have to buy something that's not on the list. Those are two man rules. When you go to the grocery store, when you're sent to the grocery store. Now, when, when I was sent, I, I, the wrong thing, I, I'm good at that. But then the other thing is this. Sometimes I would buy something. Used to, my go-to was something sweet, and I love these things. I don't eat them much anymore. But ding-dongs, man. Everybody, I'm convinced in heaven there's going to be ding-dongs. There's got to be. These wonderful cakes with cream filling. I don't know how they get it in there, but man, it's just awesome. And then the problem is, is too many ding-dongs cause muffin tops. <laughs> and so I don't want that kind of thing. And so I, 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 I just... Maybe for you, maybe for me it was like a $2 ding-dong cake. For, for maybe you it's something a little bit bigger. Maybe for you it's a boat or a car, or an outfit, or a purse, or you fill in the blank. <laughs> Somebody just lost their joy today. <laughs> when, I, when I said that, I heard, oh, I heard that. Somebody just lost their joy. But you know, that's exactly what the world does, is it tells you if you buy this, if you get this, if you have this, if you'll trade this in, if you'll get the latest and greatest, then you're going to be happy. And yet you're not still happy because God doesn't want you to be happy when it's only based on the things of this world. There's a scripture that will rock your world on this. It's in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. John is so direct here. I love 1 John. If you read 1 John, you'll find John doesn't pull any punches. He just tells you like it is. And he does that right here in chapter 2, verse 15. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. I emphasize this next portion of Scripture because I think it's so huge. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you are looking for the things of the world to make you happy, if you're looking for the things of the world to give you contentment, if you're looking for the things of the world to fill that God-shaped hole in your heart, can I tell you, you are not someone who has the love of the Father in them. Mm. Man, that convicts me. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Then he goes on to say, for all is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world and its desires are passing away, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. God does not want you above all else to be happy when it causes you to do the wrong thing or to do something sinful or unwise. He also doesn't want you to be happy when it's only based on the things of the world. God doesn't want you to be happy as much as God wants you to be blessed. God has a far better thing than your happiness. He wants you to be blessed. Happiness is based on happenings. But a blessed life is based upon His goodness. It's based upon His presence in your life. In fact, that, uh, the Greek word that's translated and used for blessed is called makaros. And it, is just, it simply means this, supremely blessed. 
And you can literally translate it this way, more than happy. God wants you to be more than happy. The problem is, is if I tell you that, if I tell you that God wants you to be blessed, most of you, your mind, or a lot of people's mind goes to this thought, well, that means that God wants me to have more money. Or that God wants me to have perfect health. Or God wants me to have the next latest, greatest thing. But that's not what the blessed life is. When God wants you blessed, it doesn't mean that you won't have a bad day. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be rosy all the time. It doesn't mean that your kids won't fight. It doesn't mean that your car won't break down. It doesn't mean that you won't get a big zit on your nose on your wedding day. Those things are going to happen. But what it means is this. If you will experience the goodness of God in the middle of some difficulties of life, your happiness and the blessings of God, you will understand, are not based upon this world, but they are based on a relationship that you have with God. Jesus said this, and we've used this a couple of different times throughout the last few weeks. In this world, you're going to have heartache. You're going to have trouble. But he also says, take heart because I've overcome the world. I think the problem is for some of us, we're looking for this pain-free life, this perfect life. And if we don't have it, we'll start to blame God. When the reality is God wants to be active even in your pain-filled life. Just because we, live, because we live in a sinful, broken world, God wants you to turn to Him and understand that just because things aren't going perfectly doesn't mean that you're uh, not going to be surrounded by Him. It doesn't mean that you're not going to feel weak. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have storms in your life. But in the middle of the storm, you can have a blessing. But what's the blessing? The blessing is the supernatural peace of God that goes beyond your human ability to understand, that can even or even comprehend that peace that can guard your mind, it can guard your heart, it can guard your soul. And some of you today, man, you're in the middle of that kind of storm. And can I just encourage you with this thought? In a moment, if you will take your focus off of the winds and the waves for a minute, if you'll take your focus off the things that, that the world says are important for just a minute and you'll put them on God, can I tell you, He's the God that says, I can do all of this. I can give you a peace that can move in your heart and you will recognize that even though I'm in the midst of this storm, I know the peace speaker and I know Him by name. In the middle of a trial, none of us would ever choose to go through pain. There's no, that line would be super short. Maybe you don't even understand what it, what, what's going on, but man, you have this joy that's in your heart and people are saying, man, what's up with you? Why, why? You're in the midst of this hurt, man. How, how are you doing this? I don't know, but I have this joy that comes from God and it only comes from him. We don't choose those things. As a matter of fact, David said this. David said in Psalm 37, 4, he said, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. The thing is, is we like to take that verse and kind of do whoop, this thing with it too. And we want, oh, the desires of my heart. Well, God, you know how much I need that new driver. God, you know how much I need that new hunting rifle. God, you know how much I need, then we start this laundry list. But th what, what David is saying here is this, and we can't miss this, if you delight yourself in the Lord. The key to having the desires of your heart met is the fact that the desires of your heart are not worldly. If you delight yourself in the Lord and you ask God to say, God, I want you to take not only first place, I want you to have all places. I want everything of my life to be filtered through you. And as I begin to understand that concept and I begin to put my life in his hands, then I understand that the desires of my heart have changed. Because now it's not the desires of my heart because my heart and his heart have become one. And so now the desires of my heart are the desires of his heart. Do you understand? Follow that. 
And I think we have to get to the place of saying, God, I understand that, that I, I need you. you. I've got this God-shaped hole inside of me, and I need you. And so as I seek you, as I enjoy you, as I seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, as I pursue you, and you're the object of my affection, I'm not going to pursue happiness, but I'm going to pursue God, then all of a sudden I understand something very, very key. I understand the depth of his love for me. I understand what it means to really serve him when his desires become my desires. When I pray according to his will, he gives us what we pray for. And all of a sudden I'm having, I'm enjoying I walk with the Lord and I become this pliable thing and I'm being conformed into his image and I'm not praying about what I want, but I'm praying about what he wants. There's a, a story by Max Lucado and I want to share this kind of thought process with it today. If, if I took a fish and took him and, and out of the water and put it on the beach, would that fish be happy? Yes or no? No. Why? Because there's no water, right? What if I gave that, kid, that fish a big wad of cash? If I gave him $100,000, would that fish be happy? No. Okay, what if I gave him a lounge chair and a Pepsi and a magazine with that big wad of cash? Is that fish going to be happy? No. Why? Why? Because the fish wasn't created for the sand. The fish was created for the ocean. Let me just kind of take this and put it this way. If you have everything this world has to offer, you will, will, will you be ultimately and lastingly happy? No. Why? Because you were not created for this earth. You've got to get that. You are not created for this earth. You have a heavenly, eternal creation. You were created for God. You were created for heaven. Earth, the Bible says, is like a vapor. This life is like a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. But you're created to glorify the God of this universe. He's not here to serve us. We exist to serve Him. So some of us in this room today need to lower our expectations of this earth. I don't need the new stuff. I don't have to have the huge house. I, I don't need that, that big promotion. I, I don't need that new person to satisfy the cravings of my heart. I've got to have Jesus fill this God-sized void in me. You know, I've met people that have tried everything possible to fill that. And maybe you have too. They've partied their brains out. They've consumed everything they could. They tried every hobby under the sun. They've rearranged their body. They've traded in boyfriends and girlfriends. They traded jobs. They moved from town to town. But they find that nothing ever fulfills. Why? Because all of that stuff is counterfeit. It's not the real thing. There's so much more. And that's a life that's solely committed and submitted to God. So our heart process and our, our life should go something like this. Lord, I belong to you. Would you lead me and guide me? Would you take me because my gifts, my heart, my passion, my life, it's all yours. Would you help me walk by faith and not by sight? Lord, would you give me the words to say to make a difference today? These hands, Lord, they're your hands. You can use them. My feet, Lord, they're your feet. You can use them. My mouth, it's your mouth, God. Give me words to be a blessing to someone today. And suddenly you're delighting yourself in the Lord and you're giving Him the desires of your heart and your desires are becoming His desires and, and you're praying and you're living this very blessed life. That doesn't mean that your life's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that it's going to be pain-free, but it will be blessed because you're living in the presence of God. 
I challenge you with this thought. God doesn't want you to be happy if, it's gonna, if you're going to do things that cause you to do things that's unwise or sinful. If it's going to cause you to think about the world, you've got to change your mindset. Stop thinking about temporary things. Start thinking about eternal things. Would you bow your head as we pray? Father, right now, I thank you that your word is truth. And that word sets us free, God, from these cultural things that bring bondage in your heart. I pray, God, that you would work in people today. This morning, you're here, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. And I really think that most everyone in the room would probably say yes to this. How many of you want to be truly blessed by God more than you can imagine? Would you lift your hand? I want to be blessed by God more than I could ever imagine. I think that's everybody in the room. That's virtually everybody in the room. If that's the case, I want to challenge you with this thought. I want to challenge you with the fact that you wouldn't pursue happiness, but you would pursue Jesus. If you want to be blessed by God, you might have to change your perspective a little bit. You might have to change some things in your life. God, I pray, give us the supernatural ability to not be lured into the loving this world. Because when we do that, the love of the Father is not in us. Maybe you're here today and, and you're struggling with that. And you be honest with yourself. You be honest with God. And you say, God, I need to change my focus a little bit. I need to change my heart. If that's you this morning, the Holy Spirit is speaking in your heart right now, would you just slip up your hand? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray for you today. But before, after I pray, I'd like for you to just stay in this attitude of prayer because I got one more thing I want to talk about real quick. Father, right now, we are asking God for you to come and change us. Lord, there are things in our life, God, that we know aren't, aren't pleasing. God, we know that our desires are sometimes about happiness and selfishness. But God, today I surrender my heart. Would you do that today? Would you pray that prayer? God, I surrender my heart and I give my life completely to you. And I ask you, Lord, to let me not be so enamored by the things of this world God, I want to have a focus that's on you. I want to pursue happiness. I want to pursue you. So God, I pray today, would you break off those desires in my heart? Lord, your word says that if we love the things of this world and the love of the Father is not in them, God, I don't want to love the things of this world. Help me to get an eternal perspective. I want to love the things of you. I want to love you, God. And I want to go after you with all my heart. Help me, Lord, in that in Jesus' name. And this morning as we conclude, you're here today and you've never accepted Christ into your life. You've got that God-sized hole in your heart. And maybe you're here today and you've tried to fill that with so many things. 
tried to fill it with people, you've tried to fill it with relationships, you've tried to fill it with hobbies and stuff, you've tried to fill it with the newest, the latest, the greatest, you've tried so many things and, and you've just, you come here today and it's, you just find yourself in a place where you're just not satisfied. But today you say, you know what, I've heard what you said, Pastor, and I want to make a decision. I know I need Jesus. He's the only one that's going to fill that hole in my life. If that's you this morning, would you slip up your hand? We want to pray with you today. Is there anyone here this morning? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Yes. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me across the sanctuary today? I'm going to ask if you would please to repeat this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I made a decision today that I want to serve you. I'm asking you, Lord, to fill the hole that's in my heart. Lord, I've tried so many things, but they've failed. And today, I humbly come before you and ask you to forgive me. Forgive me of my sin and come into my heart. I invite you to fill that void today, Lord. I've decided I'm going to pursue you. Help me, Lord, as I do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can somebody give the Lord praise today? God is so good. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.